All right, those of you expecting to get out of here real quick, just because we got a five-verse psalm, better think again. Get comfortable. We've got a lot of depth to the Word of God tonight. So, no, I don't know how long I'll be preaching for tonight, but every time I think I'm, it's not going to be very long, it turns out to be long. So, we'll see. It is what it is. Let's dig into the Word of God, though. Uh, it's a great passage here. It's only five verses, but uh, it is full of great wisdom nonetheless. Let's dig in here. Verse number one, the Bible reads, The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. Wherewith he hath girded himself, the world also is established that it cannot be moved. And I'm going to be uh, dealing with the first and second half of this verse kind of in order here. Um, the first one, that the Lord reigneth and and well i'll get into that in just a second he replaced here turn if you go to first samuel chapter eight. First samuel chapter eight the lord reigns and we need to understand that that god ultimately is in charge and he's reigns and he he rules um he is the king right he is he he reigns and god is of course omnipotent He's all-powerful. He knows everything. He's omniscient, and of course, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. These are attributes of, of God that, um, that kind of make God who he is, but um, God's all-powerful. God, God reigns, and, and even though we live in a world where we have a lot of wicked people and, and spiritual wickedness in high places and, and people who have positions of power and it may feel like there's nothing that we can do against that, and sometimes it's, you know, and that's what, what the people that, are, the wicked people of power want you to think, is that there's nothing that you can do about that. They want you to feel helpless. They want you to, to feel that way. Um, but when you know that God truly is in charge and that God reigns, and there, man, there's, so much, there's so much to say about this. God reigning, God reigns in heaven right now. And one day on earth, things will be as they are in heaven with all of God's authority, all of God's rules, all of, all of you know, God's whole system being put into place here. But of course, it's not the way it is right now here. But it doesn't mean that God's not still, you know, doesn't still reign in heaven. But he's, he's gives uh, space, I guess you can say, for things to happen the way that they do here on earth, right? For, for evil forces to work, there's that, that happens. People, you know, he's given us a free will and he's allowing for certain things to play out until he rights every wrong and sets up his throne here on earth. And this psalm, it, it, this is actually very important to understand that. And, and when it's referring to the reigning and stuff, obviously God reigns, but... Um, Right now, it's, it's here on this earth, it's by choice. And, and there's, even as such a short psalm as this, it, it still will speak. And, and as we get in this deeper and we start looking at some cross-references, you'll understand what I'm getting at with the, um, the tying together of these concepts with the reigning in the future of, of, of ultimately reigning here on earth. But first, let's, let's deal with this first half and, and look at some scripture here from 1 Samuel chapter 8, and understand this in the Old Testament, in God's design for his people, God's design for, for government here to work on earth was that he is the king and that he would reign and that he is supposed to be seen as the supreme ruler, as God, right? And that his people would form this nation. He, he would bless them. He would protect them. He would do everything that a king would do, a good king would do for his subjects. He, he promised to do for his people. But of course, his people can't just reject him and want to have nothing to do with him, right? They're going to uh, want, have to serve him. And, and when you serve the king, well, the king's going to offer his protection. The king's going to offer his blessings. And that's the way that, that God designed it for his people to live on this earth. You know, obviously things were a little bit different in the Garden of Eden, but God was still supreme and God still reigned even back then. He established more of the law given to Moses 
and given to his people to be applied. But even throughout the law, there was, there was no supreme ruler among men. There were judges. There were people who would help lead. There were people that would help to, to um, you know, show the will of God and to be able to know God's word and be able to uh, preach on the commandments and teach what's right and wrong and be able to discern and judge between right and wrong. But there was, there was never a design of having, you know, a, a ruler in charge. And even, you know, our, our government here, our republic, our democratic republic, that's, that's not the way that God designed things to be either with his people. I'm not saying it's a horrible form of government that we have, but it's, it's not. There may be many principles that have been applied from Scripture, and I do believe that there was a lot of wisdom that was taken from Scripture to apply to the form of government that we have, but it's not the government that God set up. The government that God set up was a kingdom with him in charge. And I believe ultimately that's the way, the, the best government will be set up that way. It's a theocracy. And it's one where God rules and reigns, and, and that you're going to decide and say, you know what, this is the law of the land. It's from God's word. It's literally what God says. It's what God commands. That is what would be the best system of government, in my opinion, based on scripture. I mean, because how, how, how could you say, well, no, that was only for them back then. But okay, if that was only for them back then, right? And, and yes, there's an aspect of that only to them as far as the Levitical priesthood goes. But not all the laws of the land, though. Like, they weren't all... All the laws didn't apply just to a Levitical priesthood, right? The moral laws, the, the, the killing and the stealing and all the, all the laws and the punishments that would be associated with those laws, you know, okay, we don't have to do sacrifices, but that's not the same as, as all the rest of the laws that we see that were given to mankind. And we see this clearly spelled out so when you, when you think about the Bible as a whole, you think about the first five books of the Bible, you've got Genesis, which gives us the history of mankind all the way up through, you know, Abraham and then ultimately up to Moses, right? Up to Joseph, it kind of ends with, with Joseph, right? And then you've got a gap when Moses arises after the children of Israel were taken captive. So it just kind of tells you, okay, there's been some generations here that didn't know, people rose, didn't know Joseph, the Hebrews began to be enslaved because they were multiplied. God has blessed them and everything, and, and the Egyptians wanted to keep them down and keep them subdued and under control. So then, of course, Exodus, you've got Moses being the main figure, the main character there, being having God's law delivered unto him. Um, Leviticus, continuation of that. Uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all of that is, is kind of stories regarding Moses and getting the law and, 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 and dealing with all of that. And then you have the book of Joshua, where Joshua takes over the mantle. He takes over the leadership role that Moses had. Now, look, Moses wasn't the king. Moses was the spokesman for God, right? So who is in charge? God's in charge. And who is Moses? Ultimately, nobody. Moses is a guy that God chose to speak to. Now, he's a great man. He was a godly man. He was a righteous man. But, but at the end of the day, he, he wasn't an elected official. He wasn't even you know, necessarily like appointed to some, to some specific office other than he was the one that God had chosen to be the one that he was communicate with and to lead the people. I mean, he's naturally he was leading. He's the one showing the right way, providing the direction, but wasn't a lord, wasn't a ruler, right? He was a judge because he knew the word of God. But then Joshua comes along and he's another leader. So he's someone who says, hey, look, guys, let's all rally the troops and get together and follow God the way that Moses followed God, right? And, and, and God worked with Joshua that same way to go into the promised land and, and to fight the battles and, and, and to do all those things. And then after Joshua, you've got the book of the judges, right? So if you think about it, from the time that God delivered his people out of bondage and out of slavery, brings them into the promised land, we're starting to see getting put into place how, you know, some of it, obviously it's not all correct what all the judges did, but this was the system that they were putting in place. You've got the law of God. It tells you, okay, here's, here are the rules, here are the laws, here's the commandments. God's the one who gave them. You know, man isn't making up all these rules himself. God is the one who decides what's right and wrong. God gives us our morality. God's the one who decides these things to be true. Gives that to uh, mankind. 
and then essentially just sets up a system where you're going to have leaders, you're going to have judges, but they're not kings, they're not, they're not presidents, they're not uh, holding these offices of, of authority as much as they're just leaders of the people, right? They're the guides, they're the leaders, they're the ones that are going to say, no, look, we, we need to follow the word of God, right? And, ju and just get the people together to do that. And also judge and just say, okay, hey, do, you know, the, the matters that come up, be able to judge between what's right and what's wrong. And this lasted all the way up through the book of Samuel, right? First Samuel is when Samuel is the last judge to, to be one of that style of judges amongst the people, amongst the children of Israel, God's people, where they finally just said, you know what? We want a king. We want a king. And that shift, that change, that desire to want to have a man now to rule and to reign over them was a big deal, was a big transition where God says here, and look at verse number six in 1 Samuel chapter eight. It says, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. Because look, they had judges to judge them and they had the word of God. But then they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. And this is how God sees it. And look, obviously God understands and knows the truth here. God's not wrong about this. In their heart, they, did, they, they ultimately they didn't want to have to rely on God to be their king, to be their ruler, to be in charge. They felt more comfortable to saying, hey, just give us a man. Give us this king. We want, it. We want to be like the other nations they're about. And, and we're not going to read all the, all the different contexts here. I'll turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 12. But they go in and they say, like, we, we see the nations round about us. They've got someone that goes out to their battles and fights for them and is going to lead the way. And there he's their king. And they all, you know, people all look up to him and say, we want to have a king too, just like, just like the world has. And God said, like, no, you're, you're different from the world. No, I'm your king. And obviously to have a system in place where you're trusting God, it requires a lot of faith. You have to trust. When, when, when you make God your king, when you, when you recognize, hey, God reigns. God's in charge. He's reigning in heaven. And he's our king, which means he's the one that's going to go out before us into battle. And he promised them that too. And if you look through the law, he, he gives them those promises. He's like, look, you just got to obey my commandments. I'm in charge. Here's my law. Here's my rules. Keep these and I'll bless you. I'll protect you. I'll make you. I'll make your, your, your ground to grow and, and your crops and, and you'll, have, you'll be very successful. And I'll, I'll defend you from your enemies. You'll be prosperous. Just be obedient and, and live under my rule and my reign and everything will be good for you. But then the day comes where they just, the people just kind of collectively decide, no, you know what, we just, we just want to have a king. And what's interesting about this, too, is that part, part of this, I believe, is due to some failure of men, right? So Samuel's children weren't up to stuff. They, they weren't that great uh, role models, okay? They were not the type of people that they wanted to have being judges, but God never said that the judge was supposed to be by inheritance either. That's the way that kings ruled. So Samuel's kids didn't have to be the next judges. You read through the book of Judges, there's, there's all these different people that, that rise up to lead the people and to judge the people of God. You know, when, when different problems arise, different people arise. You've got Gideon, you've got uh, Samson, you've got, you know, Jephthah. You've got all these different judges that have come from different tribes, from different people that they... they, they end up taking this responsibility and this job of being this leader and judging the people. But, um, you know, they've got it in their head and they're looking to Samuel's children and going like, oh, well, we don't want to have these guys. It's kind of like, well, is there no one else that can, that can step up and, and be a good judge? But the people in their hearts have already turned away from the Lord. And he says, well, he says, look, they've rejected me. Don't, don't, don't take it personally, Samuel, because it's not you that they're rejecting. It's me that they're rejecting. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse number 9. The Bible reads, and when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the host of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines. 
and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. And they cried unto the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served Balaam and Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve thee. And the Lord sent Jerubbaal and Bedan and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and ye dwelled safe. And when ye saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, ye said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us, when the Lord your God was your king. So he's explaining to him, look, you, you saw this, you got scared when this king came against you, and that's when you decided you needed to have a king. He's like, but God was your king. God was there for you. Now, therefore, verse 13, behold the king whom ye have chosen and whom ye have desired. And behold, the Lord hath set a king over you. If ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. Now, what had happened between chapter 8 and chapter 12 is that, you know, God had said, okay, just do what they said, which he said in chapter 8, but as you continue on, he chooses uh, Saul to be the king, and God says, fine, we're going to set up the king, and here's going to be the way it is, and, and you're not going to like this that much because your king's going to now require servants, he's going to take your lands, and he's going to take, you know, like, he's going to have this power. And, and when you put a man in authority over other men like that, and you give them this position of power, it's not going to work out good for you. God's the only one that should be wielding that type of power, not other men. And, and there's so much wisdom we could gain from this when we, and, and apply to just human government and politics and, and kind of what we should be striving for. And, and this type of a system of government, one, it shows me that, that you don't want to have rulers that are in charge that, that have so much power um, because they end up abusing that power. And we see that play out, too, even in the Scripture. But two, and I think this is even more important for us because we may not be in a position to just radically change our government or something like that. And even if we could, that's not going to be the answer. Because if you have a wicked people, I don't, I don't care what system of government you have. You're, you're not going to get, and you're not going to come out of bondage. You're not going to be blessed. I mean, you could have the, whatever you think is the utopian perfect government to have. It won't work if the people are not God-fearing people and if the people haven't made the Lord their God. It just won't work. It's not going to last. It's not going to be good. It's only going to bring bondage. But what's, what's great about this, what's a little encouraging about this, however, though, is even if you don't have the most perfect government, even if you've already chosen the king, right, you already have, have shifted over to this government, which is not the one that God set up. Now you've got a man in charge. Now you've got all these problems that are going to come along with being a king. But he says this in verse 14, but if you'll fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice, he says, if ye, so all of you, speaking to all the people, not if the king's going to serve the Lord, if ye, if, if you all will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, Right? Be obedient to God's commandments and do what God says. Then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. So he's like, if, if all of you people do right and, and follow God and obey his commandments, then not only will you, but also your king will in turn uh, that reigns over you continue following the Lord your God. And we see here, the king being more of a representation of the people than the king being the reason of all of the, the problems of a land, right? The people being the problem is the real issue. And that gets reflected in governments all the time. When you have a wicked people, well, you know what? You're going to end up having wicked rulers, it ju it's just going to be the reflection of, of the hearts and the minds of the people. And, you know, we keep getting more and more and more wicked rulers being 
put into office in our land, in our country. Why? Because the people are getting increasingly more wicked. It's just a reflection of how the people are going. And as believers, we ought not to be looking to any political leader as our savior, as someone who's going to make things right again and make America great again and do all these you know, wonderful things for our country. Because if you're not, if someone doesn't rise up, if a leader doesn't rise up that says, look, we need to get back to Christianity. We need to get back to the Bible. We need to make the Lord our God and live a righteous life and get rid of all this smut and the garbage and the pornography and all the trash and the filth that's being, you know, if, if a leader rises up like that and the people get behind a leader like that, then we can see prosperity. Then we can see a country become great. But until that happens, look, I'm not going to get all excited or all up in arms about any political candidate that just can, can manage money well or, or whatever. That's why when they're super wicked anyways and the people are all wicked, we're not, we're, you're not going to, what are you going to do? What are you going to accomplish? And this is a truth that I learned a long time ago. Thank God. Because I had a huge interest in politics. And I, you know, I'm sorry if I bore you again. I've told this story before. But I had a huge interest in politics back in, in 2007. Right around that time. 2006, 2007, 2008. And for the right reasons, you know, it's like, oh, man, yeah, you're kind of waking up to different ideas and learning things, uh, learning some truths, seeing, seeing how, um, you know, things ought to work and, and how broken the system is and stuff. And I wanted to, to be a part of that and help change things and make things better. But it wouldn't have really done anything. One, the system's so corrupt right now anyways, you have to play the game, you have to play ball in order to, to try to get anything done. But you know what playing the game and playing ball means? You're corrupting yourself. Because if you don't play the game, nothing's going to happen. You're not going to be there very long. You know, people of integrity don't last in government. People have good ideals maybe when they get started, but at the end of the day, I mean... Time and time and time and time and time again, you see it playing out. People talk a big game, and then they end up just being these huge hypocrites and guilty of all the things that they're uh, accusing everyone else of, and it's all just corrupt and money and everything else. Politics isn't the answer. It's just not. It's not. And here's why serving the Lord, preaching the gospel, and preaching the truth, and just preaching the word of God, and reaching people and discipling people is the answer because if you get people right in the word of God and right on morality and the moral issues, you don't have to worry about the way that they vote. That'll take care of itself because you need their heart to be right. You need people to understand and know why something's right, why something's wrong, and then be able to have a good conscience to be able to say, yeah, no, that's a wicked person. These are wicked people and these are wicked laws and wicked or whatever. To then that change can come later as a result, but it only is going to come by reaching the hearts and the minds of people with the truth and shedding the light of the gospel into people's hearts. Without that, it's, it's all vain. It's all vanity. It's not going to do any good. Will you buy yourself a few more years? Before what? It's the ultimate destruction anyways. If people just continue to turn their hearts away from the Lord and serve Baal, we're just, we're just facing impending doom anyways. And you will never stop that with a political leader because God will squash them. If we had a Nebuchadnezzar to be our great leader and to rule the whole world and be in charge, our great American empire can be in charge and ruling everybody, and then God could turn him into a beast for seven years. Because man is nothing to God. And choose your rule. I mean, who cares? Whatever rule. No, no human ruler is going to ever bring you the peace and the prosperity and the stuff that you might be seeking, only God can do that. And we clearly see, hey, look, if you, if you, if you fear the Lord, serve him, obey his voice, then both you and your king, God will bless you with a good king. God will bless you with a good ruler. We'll continue following the Lord your God. But getting this first step right of recognizing the Lord as being the king. The Lord reigneth. 
Okay, and we have, it's great to have a good personal view of God, right? To have a familiar view of, hey, God the Father, I'm a son. That's an awesome relationship. It's an awesome way to, to view God and to, and to think about God. But don't forget, it's also God the King, God the ruler, God the Lord, who's the boss and in charge, right, that you respect, not just the respect of a father, but the respect of a boss, the respect of God. And, and people need to get that mind back, the fear of the Lord. We need the fear of the Lord in this country, in the world, big time. Turn if you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. 1 Chronicles chapter 16. Now I want to pivot a little bit to the second half of verse number one. Yes, we're only in verse number one. <laughs> I, told, I warned you. Where it, it reads there, the world also is established that it cannot be moved. Now, there's some teachings out there that will take verses like Psalm 93, and as we're going to see, Psalm 96, and we're going to look at Psalm 104 and 1 Chronicles chapter 16, to where, where, where they'll take this passage and say, see, look, there's no way that the world can be orbiting, you know, our earth can be orbiting the sun because the Bible says here, hey, the world also is established that it cannot be moved. Taking a, I guess, a hyper-literal interpretation of this passage. And first, I want, I want to point out, while absolutely the book of Psalms is the word of God and we, and we study it as such, you know, you cannot ignore the fact that it is also a songbook and the language is poetic language just in general. It doesn't mean you can't take any of it literal. It doesn't mean, you know, that. But when, when we're going to determine and say, well, hey, what is the, the fact of nature of the earth or the world that we live in? And then go to a verse that's talking about the world being established that it can't be moved in relation to objects in motion from a, a universal perspective. I think you're making a leap or, or a, a great broad application here that isn't necessarily warranted because there's no reference here other than just, hey, it can't be moved. Well, that can have a lot of meanings to it and be completely valid and true, especially in the context here of God reigning and then, you know, the earth being established. Hey, him being the ruler is established. But at some point we say, okay, the world is established and it can't be moved. And we're going to read some other passages that are real similar to this. Let me ask you this. What, what happens in an earthquake? Has anyone ever felt an earthquake before or at least seen one? On the TV, what happens? The earth shakes, right? Earth quake, right? The quaking is like a shaking. You know those Quakers? You know the Quakers were like these Pentecostals because they would, they would shake around and, and be slain in the spirit and stuff. And that's why they're called the Quakers because they would, they would move like uncontrollably. Um, I don't know if you knew that. So like your Quaker oats that you ate, that guy was like a, a Pentecostal heretic, but... <laughs> but his oats were pretty good. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that had to do with the sermon. But anyways. Oh, yeah. The earth, the world is established. It can't be moved. So, you know, is this literally just talking about some physical motion? Well, it would, it would literally be a violation. If, if you had to apply it that way, if you're going to take it and apply it that way, that we can't be in orbit because in orbit means there's motion, right? But, but the ground shakes with an earthquake. Like the literal earth. I, I, I don't see how you can, you know, so I, I would say clearly it can't just be talking about like the physical 
motion or mobility of, of the earth being established that it can't be moved. There's powers that can't be moved. God establishes things and they can't be moved. It's, it's that concept and that mind. And, and ultimately, obviously, there's this huge planet that we live on and just massive mass, just as this thing that's, that's this, this huge uh, thing, entity, right? That, that, like, yeah, you can't move that. I mean, we can't just push against that force of the earth and, like, really, really do anything. We dig into it a little bit. We use these tools and stuff but it can't be moved. I mean, that is a much more appropriate understanding. Like, look, this, this is the stuff's established and it can't be moved. It can't be changed. It's not gonna be, uh, there's not really much you can do to it. But let's look at some of the other references here because people will, will take this and, and run with it and try to come up with doctrines. It starts with geocentricity and then it turns into flat earth real fast. And if you don't know what the geocentricity, geocentricity just means that there's a belief out there where people will say that, that the earth is basically like the center of the universe. It's like just the center of everything. So geo is like the earth and, and, and centricity is going to be its center. And everything revolves around that. And, they'll t and I don't want to get too deep into this. They'll, they'll say, well, see the language of the Bible where it talks about the sun moving, the sun rising, the sun setting, which we use common language today even though we still have a different understanding that like the earth rotates and that's why we see a sunset. So, you know, it's all perspective. It's all from the viewer. It's all what we see things doing and using language to explain what we see happening before our eyes. Not, um, not necessarily exactly the way things are operating. It's just from the perspective of the person speaking. So geocentricity, they've got all these complicated ways in which the planets and everything else can kind of revolve around the earth and, and try to make that work. Um, and if you believe that, I don't really care. Like, that's really not a big deal to me at all. It, it, but I don't see how you can take these passages to prove that. I think it's a misapplication of these verses to try to prove geocentricity from these things. But it, like I said, if you do, it's really not that big of a deal to me. Um, but please don't go... Uh, overboard to the next step of the flat earth because that's just you're gonna you're gonna try my patience with that and not so much that I care what the shape of the earth is but the movement itself the, the, the flat earth movement is is one of absurdity and, and people get all bent out of shape over this is, this is the great deception and all this other stuff. And they, and they literally like turn it into a salvation thing. And, and, and it's like just insane. And the, the lack of, of understanding is incredible with the people who subscribe to that. Like there's, there's just no good working model. For Anyways, I don't want to get too, too often. Let's, let's look at scripture. Let's look at these passages. Let's look at these passages that talk about the world and the earth not being moved and just come up with a good understanding of what it's saying here. Look at ver, uh, verse number 29, First Chronicles chapter 16. The Bible says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable that it be not moved. And notice, notice the wording in this particular passage. It says, to fear before him, right, all the earth, everyone, fear the Lord, and the world also shall be stable. So the result of everybody putting, you know, fearing God and putting their trust in him is that, okay, then the world's going to be stable, that it be not moved. Because if everyone's trusting in the Lord, that brings stability, right? Not, see, look right there, the earth can't be in orbit or move, you know, like, that's not what this is talking about at all. Like, why, why would you go from the concept of fearing the Lord, worshiping him, giving glory to his name, to then just be like, and by the way, the earth doesn't rotate around anything, and it's, you know, like, that's, that's, that's not what it's trying to teach. Verse 31 says, let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice, and let men say among the nations, the Lord reigneth. And, and what I want to point out, though, is that there's a lot of similarity between Psalm 93 and these other passages we're going to look at that specifically are talking about the, the, the earth or the world 
not being moved because the context matters in all these passages and it's all the same context too. It's, it's really interesting because now if we're going to get an understanding of what does it mean that the world's not going to be moved, well, maybe we should consider the contexts in all of these. In the context, and none of them is astronomy. It's not talking about Orion's belt. It's not talking about, you know, these other things that it could be referring to. It's not talking about the host of heaven. It's not talking about the stars or the moon or the sun, right, in the context of these things. It's not. Read all of the context later. You won't find anything like that astronomical in the context of this. So why is this going to all of a sudden be teaching about whether or not the earth can be in orbit? It's not. That's not what it means. Psalm 96 Verse number 10 says this, Say among the heathen, and we'll get into this in just a few weeks, Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. There it is, the reference to God being in charge, God ruling, the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. And this is referencing to God being the king and God being in charge and God reigning, which on the one hand, yes, God reigns in heaven, but on the other hand, God is going to also reign on earth, right? So we, we understand and respect that God reigns in heaven and that we should be looking to him as our king and looking to him as our God because he is, but also that there's a prophetic portion of this of the kingdom to come to this earth where God literally be ruling and reigning with, you know, from a throne in Jerusalem. Right? Like that's literally going to happen. So, and when that happens, look, the world is going to be stable. You're not going to have the worldwide conflicts. You're not going to have uh, all, anything like we have today at all. I mean, it's, it's just going to be totally different. There's going to be peace and prosperity and, and, and everything's going to be running right. And it will be immovable. And there's nothing the enemies even going to be able to do about it because when Satan gets released and they finally try to come after and, and, and attack Jesus and attack all believers... Uh, you know, there's just going to be this sword that comes out of God's mouth that's just going to devour them and they're just going to be done. Amen. Psalm 104, verse number five. And, and I want to point this out because there's not that many verses that, that are talking about this being established. And I, I even tried to look up the, where the people who teach this stuff, like, like you tell me what are the verses that you use, Right? And other than the First Chronicles chapter 16, everything else is like in Psalms. It's like, really? You're going to go to the poetic books to, 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 to make a, a claim like this? I mean, come on. And also, though, why don't you start comparing Scripture with Scripture and see if they actually have similar context, which they do, and use that to determine what you want to believe instead of deciding what you want to believe and then trying to make the Bible fit what you want to believe. Because that's what these people ultimately are doing. So I turn to Psalm 104, right? That's where we're at. Psalm 104, verse number 5. Who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever? Now, this you could say, okay, well, this is talk. See, this is talking about the beginning. Yeah, it is. The foundations of the earth that it what? Should not be removed forever. Thou coveredst it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. And that's going all the way back to the beginning. And then, of course, that changed. Did it not? And then turn, if you would, to Psalm 99, verse number 1. And this is, this is really interesting. Psalm 99, verse number 1. The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. And there is, there is going to be a movement of the earth when God destroys it and changes it and, and we have a new heaven and a new earth. Right? But the fact is, look, when God is reigning, when God is ruling, you know, the earth's going to conform to God, but God's going to establish things and make it that it can't be moved. And that's who God is, and that speaks to the power of God, which we're also going to see in this psalm as well, in Psalm 93. Um, and turn if you go to one last place, Isaiah 24, on this same point. 
because I actually have another reference for when the earth will be moved, as it says there in Psalm 99, let the earth be moved, from Isaiah 24. Now I will say this, nowhere does the Bible talk about the, the earth orbiting the sun. I mean, the best thing you could have is talk about its circuits, you know, um, in the heavens, but like, there's, there's not, there's not, it's not, the Bible doesn't give us all of that information about how all of the astronomical features work, right? There's a little bit of stuff there, but there's not much, which is why I don't really care that much what you think about that. If you don't think that's, you know, if you say, nope. We're, we're the center of God's attention and we're everything here, so everything revolves around us. Well, I could just as easily say, well, I think Jesus is more important than us and the fact that we revolve around the sun and that even in the scripture, the sun, S-U-N, is one reference to the sun, S-O-N. So to say a heliocentric model is wicked or something like, well, we go around the sun, we revolve around the sun, we get our light from the sun, we get, you know, like, that seems pretty scriptural to me. That seems like a very workable worldview compared to scripture, right? I mean, I get where people are coming from that want to say, hey, everything's revolving around the earth because God made us, he made us special. I get it. But... Don't go saying, oh, that wicked heliocentric mother. Uh, really? I don't, doesn't seem that wicked to me. I don't know. But look at Isaiah 24, verse number 17. The Bible reads, fear and the pit and the snare are upon the inhabitant of the earth. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. So about the foundations not being moved, well, now it's talking about them shaking. Again, this, the, you know, like, like, what does it mean? Of course, it has to mean something. The foundation's not being moved, it has to mean something. But if they're being shaken here, then obviously that's not really what it's talking about, except unless it's just talking about it being established for a long time until... It is moved until there is an end, until God does just come forth and bring forth his wrath and then ultimately just change and destroy this world to create a new heaven and new earth, which is really what we're seeing in the context here. Verse number 19, the earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean, dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. It's what? Oh, yeah, it's moved. It's moved how much? Exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. Now look, this is not contradiction in scripture because it doesn't mean what other people are trying to apply and make it mean. It has a meaning, absolutely. But we have to understand in the context, and especially in the context of the old Bible, what is it talking about? Verse 21, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. So this is obviously talking about the wrath of God coming, Jesus Christ, the sun, the moon, the cloud, you know, sun and moon are darkened, stars fall from heaven. All of this stuff happens, talking about the day of the Lord, talking about that great destruction, talking about the earth being removed, you know, all of this stuff, all this destruction being prophesied in Isaiah 24. But this is the end, right? This is the end result of things. This isn't just... Um, you know, God establishing his power. And notice the reference to the kings and the, those in power and everything also plays a factor in these passages because God is setting up his kingdom. He's, he's removing it from the wicked people who are here on earth at this time. So then God reigns and God reigns supreme. 
and and in every single one of these references God reigning and the earth not being moved go hand in hand when wicked men are reigning that's a different story until God writes it and he shakes up the earth that they have and sets up a immovable reign for himself and when God is ruling and reigning things are stable and you cannot move that you know just just like the door if God opens a door you can't close it. if God closes the door you can't open it it's the same concept talking about the world or talking about whatever like that when God does it and God's in charge and God's ruling and reigning then that's the way it is and ultimately that's the the concept being let's go all the way back to Psalm 93 that's being taught here Verse number two, thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. Now, now here's one interesting piece I don't think I covered when I, when I brought up a couple weeks ago about the, the new modern versions that take the, the, the prophecy of Christ and they talk about him having an origin and origins are of old and ancient days and stuff like that when the Bible says you're from everlasting. They change it when it's about Christ, but they don't change it here. Because look, this is talking about God. This is talking about the Lord. So they don't have a problem saying that the Lord is from everlasting. Yeah, you're from everlasting. And in all, I checked a bunch of the modern versions, and they all just say, yep, you're from everlasting. You're from, like, they don't touch this at all. They don't want to. But what, what they want to attack? The deity of Jesus Christ. That's, what's, that's where the, the problem comes in. Yeah, they're not going to go as far as to say God's not from everlasting, but they'll just go as far as to say, well, Jesus isn't God because he actually has an origin. And that's just, it's just kind of interesting when you study this stuff out and be like, well, why, why wouldn't they change it? Well, because they have to try to keep some things to, to get you to buy it and say, oh, no, see, look, it says right here he's from everlasting. Then why wouldn't it say, if it says it here, then why wouldn't it use the same exact words like it did about Jesus? Why wouldn't it? You rendered it that way here. Why wouldn't you render it that way there? Especially in the Old Testament. And, and for those of you who know, like, like the Hebrew text is not under, you know, as far as, far as what's received and what is, is, is viewed as being the correct Hebrew text, it's, it's not nearly the same as like the Greek text for the New Testament because there's a lot of different opinions on like, oh, well, this text is older and this is better and all this other stuff. You know, the, the, the modern versions will look to different manuscripts and all these different sources for their translation of the New Testament. But in the Hebrew, it's not like that. You don't have all of these different conflicting sources of Hebrew. So you really got to question it when it's like, well, why are you rendering it different here? And it's like, what, you know, they maybe they'll look at the... Um, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's, it, 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 it's enough to make you question it. I don't want to get too far down that rabbit trail. Let's keep going here in Psalm 93, verse number 3. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Uh, turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 19. So we see what God reigns verse 1 God reigns the earth shall not be moved or the world shall not be moved God's throne is established and it's been established of old God's from everlasting okay God's in charge the floods lift up their voice and we're talking about the floods it's talking about the the, the sea the like the ocean or the way you know the, this this massive force of water lifting up their waves and if you've ever been around you know serious waves crashing it get pretty loud right it's a, it's a it's a serious force you hear these waves and uh it says that the lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters yea than the mighty waves of the sea and what's interesting that we see in in revelation 19 as well as a few other places but this one i like um the way it says here is that even God's voice is like the voice of many waters. It's that same type of sound of power because you know, the crashing waves is a real powerful sound and it's a, it's a lot of force kind of coming together there, meeting the rock, 
And um, this, is, this is like what comes out of God's mouth. It's that level of, of force and power that just comes out of his mouth when he speaks. Verse number 5 of Revelation 19, the Bible says, And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And this is, this is a view from in heaven, from Revelation chapter 19, of, of what it's like and hearing, um, you know, the voice coming from that great throne. Like verse 5 says, a voice out, came out of the throne saying this. And it was this sound that was like a great multitude. It was a sound like these mighty waters. This is the sound of the power of God that comes forward. Go back to Psalm 93. We're going to finish up here in verse number 5. which is a great closing verse for the psalm. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. And just real quick, that the, thy testimonies are very sure. The, the, there, is, there is nothing more sure than the word of God. There's nothing you can trust in any more than God's testimonies, than what the word of God says. And this is what we love and we cherish is the word of God. This is what sets the Bible apart from any other religious text or religion out there in the world or any other book or author or anything written among man, anything found on this earth, because the Bible is so sure and it rings true all the time and really can't be proven false. And there's, there's men who have attempted to do it and think that, it, that it's proven false. It's not. It stands true, and it stands the test of time. And this is why you continue to have people who dedicate their lives to the teachings found in this book and serving the Lord and the God of the Bible because it's true, because so many people recognize that that is the truth. The truth. It's not, it's not because, oh, yeah, you're brainwashed. No. It's because we've experienced and seen and know the truth of God's testimonies and of God's words. We can see and understand, no, this is the right way to be. This is the truth. This is right. God's testimonies are very sure. And they're even more sure, like the, like the Apostle Peter was saying, hey, look, we have a more sure word of prophecy than even what they saw. Even the voice they heard out of heaven and the bright light they saw shining, and they saw Elias, and they saw Moses, and he said, you know what? We've got a more sure word of prophecy in the word of God. It's tried, it's true. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. God is set apart. God's word is set apart. It stands above the rest. It is pure, it is perfect, it is holy. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Bible. Thank you for giving us such great wisdom in your word. I pray that you would please open up our understanding daily to uh, what you'd have us to know and the, and the great truths that we could learn from your words, dear Lord, I pray that you would please help us not to get uh, sucked into some weird ideas and, and just false doctrines or false understandings of the world around us, Lord, but that we could properly just understand and discern what you are trying to teach us and what we can glean and what we could learn from your word and that we wouldn't get, um, I guess, too literal or overly literal in some areas where um, it's just simply not saying uh, what some people would, would teach or, or have us to believe, dear Lord, but that we can understand your word and truth. Lord, please guide us into that truth with the Holy Spirit as you promised us. Open up our understanding. And Lord, help us to bring back the spirit of the fear of the Lord in this country, in our, in our neighborhood, in our area, dear Lord, and that we can teach uh, your word and, and lead people's hearts and minds back to you and back to the things of the Bible that um, you can bless us and that maybe one day we can become a people that would uh, call the Lord our God. Uh, and it would be great to see that in our lifetime. God, help us in that endeavor. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.